Regardless of age, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, religious affiliation, political persuasions, or any other diversifying factor, porn can impact anyone. If you've recognized the harmful effects of pornography in your life, or recognize the harms pornography can cause in society, we welcome you to become a fighter and take the fighter pledge. As fighters, we strive to be bold, understanding, open-minded, and accepting. If you're ready to become an official fighter, we invite you to read the full fighter pledge and sign it at ftnd.org forward slash fighter pledge. That's ftnd.org forward slash fighter pledge. My name is Garrett Johnson, and you're listening to Consider Before Consuming, a podcast by Fight the New Drug. And in case you're new here, Fight the New Drug is a non-religious and non-legislative organization that exists to provide individuals the opportunity to make an informed decision regarding pornography by raising awareness on its harmful effects using only science, facts, and personal accounts. We want these conversations to be educational, uplifting, and hopeful as we sit down with experts, influencers, activists, and people with personal accounts, we cover a wide variety of topics that may be triggering to some. You can refer to the episode notes for a specific trigger warning. Listener discretion is advised. Today's episode is with Lynn. Lynn is in her 20s and grew up in Texas. Her first time exposure to porn was at the age of eight, but her porn consumption didn't escalate until she was 18. During this episode, Lynn talks about how her porn consumption negatively impacted her and her relationships, and what she did to finally quit for good. With that being said, let's jump into the conversation. We hope you enjoy this episode of Consider Before Consuming. That was a quick jump on. After I sent the email, I feel like you jumped on like 16 seconds later. (laughs) Yeah, I uh, had everything pulled up, so I was ready. (laughs) Nice, that's good. Do you have any questions before we get started? <clears throat> I had a couple and now my mind is like blinking, but um, <laughs> that happens. Yeah. I did have a question for you. I saw on your Instagram, you get in that ice bath. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I do get in the ice bath every day. <laughs> oh my gosh. I just I I was an athlete for 16 years, so I um I know what that ice bath feeling is like i did not enjoy it so i can't believe you do it so often (laughs) really well that's cool that you've done ice baths because a lot of people don't know what it's like oh god um what did you do and what what sport did you play i played softball for 16 years oh wow yeah i played in college that's impressive that's really cool yeah what position did you play I was a catcher which is why my lower half was in an ice bath all the time for sure that's intense Yes. That's really cool. Much. Were you good at the plate too in regards to hitting? <clears throat> I was. I actually am a full-time softball instructor now, so I teach hitting for a living. <laughs> really? Yeah. Wow, that is really cool. Are you teaching kids or adults? Uh, kids. So I am. Um, I teach hitting, catching, um, infield and outfield, and I have my age ranges from like 5 to 18, um, and I have about 30 girls I see on a weekly basis. So. Wow. Well, that's cool. So... That's one of your big interests then. What else do you like to do? Um, I really like music and movies, um, but recently I've learned I like podcasts a lot more. I started listening to them and got really hooked on them, and I I think it's because I like to learn. So um, podcasts are really informational, so I really enjoy that. But for entertainment, I really like Office Ladies because I love The Office. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, yeah, Jenna Fisher and Angela Kinsey are doing a rewatch, so every week they break down an episode and um, has like some behind-the-scenes stuff on it. So that's just like an entertainment one I like. I love The Office, too, so I need mm-hmm. to listen to that. I've yeah, watched I've... The Office through probably four times, you know? Yeah, me too. <laughs> that's awesome. And where did you grow up in Texas? I did. I grew up in Austin area. Nice. Mm -hmm. Texas is a good state. What do you love about Texas? Uh, I love the pride that comes along with it, the um, Texan pride. People that move here don't understand it until they get here. Um, But it's it's a big, like, it's just awesome to say you're from Texas. Um, And I realized that I was more, almost more proud to be a Texan than an American because when we, uh, my family and I went to Germany, 
a couple years ago and everyone asked me where I was from and I would say Texas. I would not say the United States. Oh, that's interesting. But they knew exactly where it was. So <laughs> Yeah, that makes sense. What was uh, it like growing up in Texas um, in regards to your your situation? What was your family life like and those types of things? Yeah, so um, I had a really supportive home life as a kid. Um, you know, I have some, I have two siblings and we all were athletes. We all had a really good, um, supportive systems with our grandparents, our parents. Um, Texas is a really big football state as everyone knows. And, um, baseball and softball go along with that. Um, so we all just had our own sports and, um, that was a big part of our life and just a really, you know, healthy support system. That's cool. Mm -hmm. You're lucky. You're fortunate in that way. I am. Um, well, you're on the podcast. You know, the, the, the name of the podcast is Consider Before Consuming. And the goal here is to put forth information that people can consider before consuming pornography. So I wanted to jump into your experience a little bit in regards to um, your experience with pornography. I guess we can start off kind of talking about how you first were exposed to pornography. Sure. Um, I first was exposed when I was around eight years old. Um, completely unintentional. I kind of stumbled upon it. I think that's pretty common with younger kids because um, they don't really know how to seek it out or have a desire to. So when they're that young, they just kind of stumble on it. Um, and I remember my family had like a family laptop and there was a camera on it. So my brother and sister and I would make like these little plays and skits with it um, and watch them back. So um, I remember I was logging on and I like knew I was very tech savvy I knew where to go to look for like the saved videos and that's when I came across a pornographic video um, and I had no clue what it was at the time and I instantly felt like I'm not supposed to be seeing this this is a secret um, and it also made me feel really guilty for stumbling upon it even though it was a complete accident um, and so it's kind of funny at eight years old, my first thought was my siblings cannot see this. Like they, they can't see it. So I deleted it off the computer. I knew how to do that. And um, I had no, I like I said, I had no clue what it was and the secrecy and guilt that came over me was really heavy. Um, didn't know how it got there, where it came from, what it was called. Um, and I did not ever bring it up to anybody for years. Hmm. And are your siblings younger than you? They are. So you were trying to protect them? Yes. And I think that's an older, oldest sibling thing mm -hmm. for sure. You mentioned that you felt an overwhelming like sense of guilt and then you turned to secrecy. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about that a little bit more, why you think you had those feelings? I think um, I, it's hard to explain. It's like I felt like. It, seeing seeing it next to all of the videos of my siblings and I playing around, it, it was like, okay, this is healthy, that's not. Because, um, you know, they have little thumbnails of videos. Mm -hmm. And I saw it next to all of my siblings' videos, and I was like, you know, this, this doesn't look right. Like, this is wrong. Um, and that, that secrecy, it's also like I wasn't supposed to find it. Um, but, you know, eight years old, it's hard to process that. As an adult processing it now, it, I can understand it a little better. But when I was a kid, it was so confusing because, um, you know, an eight-year-old's not supposed to see stuff like that. Right. Are you able to look back at your eight-year-old self and try to identify why you felt like you couldn't turn to your caregivers? I think um, part of me knew that maybe they were connected to that somehow. Um because I, there's no way I could have thought that that was um, my siblings or mine, you know. Yeah. So I, I felt like, oh, like I wasn't supposed to see this. This is adult stuff. Like this is, you know, mom and dad stuff. This is not mine. Um, and so, I, um, I felt that way. And even you know, as an adult looking back on it now, now I understand the guilt and shame that's associated with that. Um, personally. So looking back on that, um, that would be really difficult to bring up. Um, right. And I, I trusted my family completely with everything, but again, it was still like, I'm not supposed to see this type thing. Um, and I, I think that that was really 
hard for an eight year old who had never experienced anything like that before to just suddenly see. Yeah. And then how do you process that? Yeah. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. From there, how did your pornography consumption develop? It It's kind of funny because I'm listening to others accounts on this and a lot of like it seems like most of the time once they're exposed like they constantly want to seek it out uh-huh. um, and that was not my experience at all I um, I realized my consumption development was really different um, I deleted it because I was so shocked and didn't want my siblings to see it like I said and then I didn't really even know like what to search to find it. I never desired to look at it again. Um, my pornography consumption developed around 18 years old. Um, I had a traumatic event happen within my family um, and I started using pornography as a coping mechanism um, to kind of help process some of that trauma. Um, I was 16 when I witnessed an affair happening, which uh, led to my parents' divorce. Um, And I, like I said, 18 years old, about two years after that, when I first went to college is when I started using that as a coping mechanism. Did you notice that in college, um, other athletes on your team were also consuming it? And I guess I don't want to call out your your teammates, but Mm -hmm. I I don't know if you feel comfortable talking about if it was normalized within the locker room. Um, I don't, I'm going to say no, just because I'm not sure if there was. Um, also being a female, it's very different. Um, I know that it, now I know that it's prevalent within, you know, the female community to have a pornography addiction, but, um, I don't, I don't want to speak to anyone's experience cause I'm, I'm just not sure. Um, I do know that it was a, it was an issue with, um, some of the boys locker rooms um but again going back to being a female with this addiction it's very very different um and it almost seems like it's more isolating just because you don't really hear about females struggling with it right Mm -hmm. and you mentioned that you it was a coping mechanism i think that if i put myself in your in your position in that uh moment you're 18 years old you're leaving home you're transitioning into college, um, and then also you have that traumatic event, mm-hmm. and so I mean that makes sense that you needed that that coping mechanism in that moment, and you didn't really know where to turn. Mm-hmm. Would you label your pornography consumption at that moment around the age of eighteen as a dependency? I think so. Um, I think it it always starts as a dependency. Um, I. I've tried to explain this to people and I I don't know if some people that don't struggle with addiction don't really understand it, but no one wakes up in the morning and says, I'm going to get a pornography addiction today. Like that, that's not how the process works. So, and same thing with drugs and alcohol, like it, it becomes a something you kind of depend on and then you realize you're really in deep and then that's when it's an addiction because you can't stop. Um, you feel like you constantly need it. And when did you come to that realization that you had a dependency to pornography? I think um, it was probably when I was around 20 or so. Um, so about two years after I started, um, that's when I my life changed a lot. I switched schools. Um, I didn't have a lot of friends at this new school. Um, I was living further away from my boyfriend, so I didn't get to see him a lot. Um, And there was just a lot of change happening in my life that added stress to everything. So that's, I think that's kind of when it developed. And I realized that because anytime I was having having a stressful day or feeling emotional or a loss of control, I would start thinking about it and um, planning to like when I was going to consume it. Um, which that was kind of a wake up call, like, okay, this is a problem. Yeah, that makes sense. I guess one, one of the questions I have is regarding the escalation of the consumption. Um, it was pretty gradual. I don't remember, um, one day just having like the, the epiphany that I was consuming a lot more of it. I, I do remember, 
um, over time I would like find that the hours of my day would slip away pretty quickly and it was because I was spending a lot of time consuming it so um, I think it was it wasn't the type of pornography that escalated or the um, or the I guess the type is the right word um, it was just the duration of how I would use it so it just it took more time to get that high right um, so that's kind of when I realized it was becoming more of an addiction. Okay. So you would label it an addiction or how do you refer to your, your challenge with pornography? I think it, it was an addiction and I say was because I've found success with it. Um, I don't, I don't like the, um, the way certain addiction programs were, I'll always be an addict or I'll always be an alcoholic. I don't like that. Um, cause I think there's a lot of power in what we speak over ourselves. Um, so I, you know, or if you want to say recovering, that's another way to put it. Um, I think I definitely did have an addiction, but I've been, um, really strong with it. I haven't had problems with it in a while. So I'm, I feel a lot more healthy now, but back when I did struggle, I would say, yes, it was an addiction. That's awesome that you're doing so great. Mm -hmm. Um, can you talk to uh, the harmful effects of pornography and how they affected you as an individual? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so when you experience a um, traumatic event, um, automatically you're going to be experiencing depression, anxiety, lack of motivation, energy. Um, so with that event that I had witnessed in high school, that was already kind of on my radar um, as something I was battling. Um and addiction is really sneaky. Um, it seems like it's helping. Uh, that's why a lot of people use it as like a coping mechanism because for that split second, it makes you feel like you're okay. Um, it, but in reality, it's creating a really large wound to mend and it's just digging deeper. And so I found that pornography would let me forget and feel something other than that sadness and hopelessness for just a second and then that depression, anxiety, and lack of energy would swing back more intense than before I watched it. Um, it would be, it would kind of sink you deeper because you felt the guilt and the shame on top of your depression, anxiety. So um, I was already battling that stuff, but I think the pornography addiction just made it tenfold, kind of like way more than you, um, than I was originally planning on battling. <laughs> and I remember when I finally was able to open up to people about it um, and kind of do research on it, I'm like, wow, this is a big issue. Like, this is something that is, like, like your name is Fight the New Drug. Like, this is a like a drug. It is something that needs to be discussed. And so um, the shame that originally kind of <laughs> overcame me was, can't talk to anybody about this. Um, so you're a female, you're probably the only female in the world struggling with this. Um, this is a men's issue, you know, all that stuff. So, um, that became a big part to overcome too. I think that was probably the biggest step was to try to overcome that shame and try to be vulnerable with somebody about it. Yeah. Did you feel hopeless at times throughout this process? Oh, yeah. Big time. <laughs> um, I, uh, I never had um, suicidal plans. I never had uh, any attempts on my life, but I do remember there were days where I was like, you know what, this would be a lot easier if I just didn't have to deal with it. Um, and I have opened up to my boyfriend about that. Um, and he's been very, very supportive about that. But um, I, like I said, I never was in any crucial state, but that it did push me down to where I, I'm like, there's no way I'll ever be able to win this. It's too hard. Wow. Thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Um, the reason why I say thanks is because I think it's more common than we think to have some of those negative, negative thoughts. And mm -hmm. so I just admire your strength for talking to some of those. Yeah. How did your, going back to, you've talked about your boyfriend a couple times, Mm -hmm. um, how did pornography consumption affect your relationships, whether it be with friends, 
um, family or your significant other? Mm -hmm. Um, There were two kind of areas of relationships where I kind of put my friends and family in one and then uh, my boyfriend in another um, because my friends and family got the same treatment from me. Um, My boyfriend took the brunt of it. Um, and it's really hard for me to think back sometimes about how, um, how I mistreated him and we're still together and he's the love of my life, but he, um, he took a lot of, um, emotional and verbal abuse from me for a while. Um, I became really distant and cold and I was constantly creating fights where there was like nothing to fight about. We, um, we were a long distance couple for a long time, um, which is, you know, only about three hours away, but you know, that's still pretty difficult with work and school. Right. So, um, I would, you know, we would talk to each other, FaceTime and everything, but I think I was looking for him to fill voids in my heart and that were really, really messed up. And I don't think, I I was putting an unfair expectation on him. And um, I I was creating these relationship standards that I wanted us to reach, but I was putting all the um, expectation on him. I was not even trying to do my part. Um, And he took that for a long time. And I, um, I don't know how I did it because I think if I was, you know, looking back, I think if someone were treating me like that, I don't know how I'd be able to stay with them. Um, but you know, he's, he's been super supportive when he's, we've been together for about four years now. Um, and he's been amazing with everything. So, um, that was a big, big help for sure. That's awesome. That makes me happy. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Yeah. uh, I love to see people work through their challenges Mm -hmm. just gets me kind of stoked Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's inspiring yeah um what about other areas of your life Uh, you talked about how pornography has affected you as an individual um, some Mm -hmm. of your relationships are there other areas that we haven't mentioned um with my with regard to my friends and family relationships um I never treated them as poorly. Um, I didn't have this expectation that they should, you know, help me heal or anything. Um, I just became closed off and distant. Um, Didn't talk to anybody really, uh, which is really unlike my family because we were so close. Um, So that was something that they all kind of noticed, but they did not, you know, they're like, okay, she just is going through something. But that you know that the mistreatment never happened with them um with regards to other areas of my life i think um i've struggled with this as a student with class and then also as an adult with a job so um with both my job and my classwork i noticed i just was not motivated to go um and as someone who loves to learn and loves to work it was really um, hard for me because i just realized that I would rather just lay in bed all day than go do something I'm really passionate about or learn about something I'm really passionate about. Wow. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. One of your passions is coaching and Mm -hmm. also engaging in sports. Do you feel like pornography even negatively impact your desire to do those things? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, um, it took a lot for, I always, I try to think back on um, everything it took from me and that was a big thing um, because I'm you know anybody that knows me I'm either my boyfriend will joke about this I'm either a hundred percent into something or I could like not care less (laughs) so it's kind of funny like the things I'm very very passionate about um, I had no desire to do them at all and it was bizarre because like I said I'm I'm a hundred percent into things and so um, that was a big deal was I didn't want to go do my job. I didn't want to, you know, go learn in class about something I was really passionate about. And just, it took that passion from me. Um, and I think that that's where it creates a lot of isolation. Right. Mm -hmm. Some people are under the impression that it's an easy thing to just stop consuming pornography. Mm -hmm. Um, 
maybe someone might be skeptical and they might just say, why wouldn't you just stop then, Lynn? And so I want to pose that question to you. And I don't want to say it in an insensitive way because I know how challenging it can be. But what would you say to someone who had that perspective? Just stop. I would kind of laugh at first, to be honest with you, <laughs> because that's <laughs> not that's it's so more, much more complicated. Um, and I think um, especially as a female, um, but, you know, all all people that you know struggle with this, the isolation it creates is very strong. Um, but the way any addiction works is their brains, you know, our brains have been trained to pursue what feels good and give that momentary high. Um, and you know, no one watches pornography and thinks, okay, well, you know, after the high, I'm really excited for the depression. Like that doesn't happen. It's not something that we actively pursue. They're just looking for that momentary, what feels good. And so, um, even after that depression, it, it, the high almost seems worth it because we continue to go back to it. And so I would say to someone who asks, why can't you just stop consuming it? That it is a process. Um, it's not easy. And the way our brain was formed to want to consume pornography, it has to be formed to not want to consume it um, and kind of retrained in a way. How many times did you attempt to walk away from that dependency unsuccessfully? Oh, gosh. Um, I'd say um, I struggled with it for about five years, and I, I was actually counting because um, I remember each one distinctively, and I think there were about 27 times unsuccessfully I attempted in five years. And so how did you finally overcome it? What was the, the thing that changed? Um, I finally, um, it was actually a conversation with my boyfriend and, um, he, we had, you know, had one of those dumb fights where I was just starting something out of thin air. We've all had he, one of those before. Oh gosh. Yes. <laughs> it, and you know, they, I'm not struggling with it anymore. They still happen and it's just part of relationships. Yeah. But, um, you know, he, he looked at me and he said, you know, I know something's going on and you're not yourself. And whatever it is, we can work through it, but something has to change. Like, we can't keep doing this. And I remember the sentence that he used was, I can't keep doing this much longer. And um, he was completely unaware of this at the time. And um, that's when I literally broke down and told him everything. And um, I remember it made me so weak to even like I couldn't even stand when I was telling him I had to be like seated or laying down like it it took physically it took so much for me to tell him everything that had happened wow. um and he just wrapped me up and was like so supportive and told me he's like whatever you need to fight this like I'll be here thank you for telling me wow and I was I, I was so mad at myself for waiting so long I was like this was his reaction the whole time like the first time or the first time I realized that it was an issue, I could have brought this to him. And I realized that my fear was well founded because it, it is a heavy thing to talk about. But I just I think that that reaction can be more supportive than we think it'll be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. That puts a smile on my face to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. After that first step of that first step of honesty and vulnerability, what was next in your, as you transitioned, you talked about how it's a process. Mm -hmm. What was, what were some of the next steps you took to, to transition your mindset away from pornography? Um, I actually, I reached out to a second person because, um, I wanted someone who was more knowledgeable on it. And um, he was actually the one who introduced me to fight the new drug. And um, I had reached out, he was a good friend of mine from college. And um, I reached out to him because he was constantly sharing uh, fight the new drugs posts on his Instagram story. 
Um, and I always thought they were really interesting. And I had started doing my research, but I realized I'm like, okay, if he's sharing that, he's passionate about it. Mm-hmm. And um, so, you know, I shared with him and he instantly was supportive as well, not judgmental. Um, he was really straightforward, which is something I always admire in people. I don't like people that beat around the bush. Um, and the first thing he did, which I think is really important when dealing with such a sensitive topic, especially with relationships, the first thing he asked me was, have you told your boyfriend about this? And I said, yes, I have. And he said, does he know that you're speaking with me about this? And I said, yes, he does. And he, I think that says a lot about this because um, that can create secrecy. Um, that if I'm discussing something so sensitive with another male, that my boyfriend would have something to worry about. You know how that right. can be misconstrued. Um, That's cool that he was asking mm-hmm. those questions. Yeah, and um, I appreciated that a lot because he, he said, you're going to have to be really open and honest with me. That's the only way this is going to work. And so um, I, I don't feel comfortable with that until your boyfriend is aware. And um, that... I, I felt instantly safer <laughs> because cool. he, yeah, he was like so straightforward about it. And, um, he's been a huge part of my recovery as well. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. We should have him on the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Not to talk about your experience, but uh-huh. just to talk about his own experience. That's cool. Yeah. He, um, I told him I was doing this and he's been sending me little gifts about how proud he is of me and stuff. So <laughs> nice. yeah, he's, he's pumped about it. That's cool. Mm-hmm. And then what other steps have you taken? So, um, like I said, he introduced me to fight the new drug. So, um, that was my first place where I started looking just at the statistics. You know, there's people that are pro pornography and, um, but the statistics are really hard to argue with. And so that's when I started realizing like, okay, I fall into this percentage. Um, and, uh, my friend from college, the next thing he offered for me was um, an app called Covenant Eyes. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, for everyone else listening, um, I highly recommend it. It's really, um, it's keeps you accountable. It's like an accountability software where you put it on your phone and then you have an ally um, that it basically, the app will block pornographic images and videos and sites on your phone. Um, and if you attempt to look at it, it will, it'll say allow website. So you have the option, but what it'll do is send a notification to your ally. So, um, and then every morning we both get a email saying, you know, no suspicious activity detected or something, or if something were were to come up, he would get a notification about it. And so, um, he set that up for me and that automatically helped because even if I wanted to, I couldn't <laughs> uh, right. without repercussions. So, um, that was really awesome. He, you know, he's my ally and, um, he has helped. And I like that name too, that they named the person that's an, it's not like an admin. It's just an ally, you mm-hmm. know, just like a buddy helping you. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Um, and then the last thing I did Um, with regard that I I recommend this for everybody, but uh, I I started therapy with a CSAT, which for people that don't know, it is a certified sex addiction therapist. Um, And they don't, um, they don't just specialize in sex addiction because I don't have a sex addiction, just a pornography addiction, but they specialize in all kinds of, um, all kinds of stuff like that. So, um, She has really been able to help me dive into the deeper issues that started this, Um, which I I think a therapist would be able to do. But when they're specialized to work with pornography addiction and sex addiction, I think it's real. They really understand the different layers to it. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. So that's and I still see her from time to time just to make sure there's nothing left uncovered. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And as you've met with your your CSAT. Have you discovered anything that you think our audience would find valuable? Yeah. Um, like I said, they, they kind of identify, um, why are you watching it in the first place? Um, you're not watching it for pleasure cause it's making you feel miserable. 
you know, there's that tiny hit of pleasure, but it, it's, it, overall, it makes you feel absolutely horrible. So, um, there's a coat, there's something you're trying to heal and something you're trying to mend. Um, and so I think that that was a big deal for me. And she kind of has helped me go back through things that have happened in my life that the stressors, the, uh, traumatic events and has really unturned that and been like, okay, look, this is why. So let's process this. And then that desire to watch that will go way down. And she was absolutely right. (laughs) Cool. Yeah. Do you still have moments that you, when you want to turn back to your dependency? Um, not, not really. I don't have, I, everyone has down days, you know, where they just don't feel themselves or feel a little depressed. And I definitely will still have those, but, um, my, because I've dealt with a bunch of the stuff that has been hard in my life, I don't have that dependency like that. Oh, I need to watch pornography. Um, I, because I've, I've kind of made a list of things I could do instead or stuff that actually fills me up instead of just completely drains me. I like that. Um, yeah. What are a couple of those things, if you don't mind sharing, that do energize you instead of drain you? Uh, yeah, I um, Like I said, I love to watch The Office. That's a big <laughs> one. Um, I love to work out. Um, I've actually... Uh, that was something else I was going to share, was when I stopped consuming pornography I started taking care of myself a lot better um and working out was a big thing I kind of neglected that after I uh, quit playing my sport and so I started working out again which is something I really like that's also healthy for you um and um I love to you know read talk with friends um I love doing like lunch dates with all my friends and stuff so you know just finding things that um supply good stuff to your life instead of you know that secrecy is a big deal yeah that's Mm -hmm. great um are there any other resources that you think our audience would find value in i think there's something i thought of myself i hadn't really like seen anyone else do this i'm sure there are but um i downloaded an app called countdown um and it's cool because you can set a date in the future or in the past and have it count up or count down to it. So I set a date on the last time I consumed pornography and every day it just grows my day count until cool. since I've watched it. Yeah. And that's really encouraging. Um, I have it on like a widget on my phone. So like I can just swipe left and look in quickly how many days it's been. And today is 287. Wow. So, yeah. That's inspiring. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. And the first time, I remember um, I had texted my friend from school that helped me with Covenant Eyes um, the last time I consumed it. And he, I didn't know this, but he had also set a timer without asking or telling me at all. And oh, okay. he um, he texted me the other day and he's like, happy 200 days. I'm like, how do you know that? But <laughs> he, he'd been tracking my progress with me. And that made me really happy because he was like super into it, you know, and um into my recovery with me and so he uh and he'll occasionally just randomly send me screenshots of it (laughs) like I don't know but you know it's it's awesome to have him you know track that with me that's really cool Mm -hmm. I do want to give you the opportunity to have the last word in this conversation um do you have a final thought that you would like to share with our audience yeah um I've come to think of addiction it's it's really a battle um and it's a long process and so the best way to win is to just fight really really hard um and if you can turn your mess into a message and turn your struggle into a weapon um in that way you can help others fight and it no longer controls you you control your situation that's amazing well lynn we are so grateful that you uh, took the time to be with us today yeah thanks for having me Looking for a way to spread awareness on the harms of porn? Why not rep the movement in one of our conversation starting teas? With over 20 teas in various designs and phrases, you're bound to find something that speaks to you and will spark conversations with others. Plus, because we're a 501c3 nonprofit, there's no taxes on your purchase and the proceeds help to mobilize this movement. 
Get your gear today at ftnd.org forward slash shop. That's ftnd.org forward slash S-H-O-P. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Consider Before Consuming. Consider Before Consuming is brought to you by Fight the New Drug. Fight the New Drug is a non-religious and non-legislative organization that exists to provide individuals the opportunity to make an informed decision regarding pornography by raising awareness on its harmful effects using only science facts and personal accounts. If you want to learn more about today's guest and the conversation we had, you can check out the links included with this episode. Again, big thanks to you for listening to this conversation. As you go about your day, we invite you to increase your self-awareness, look both ways, check your blind spots, and consider before consuming.